off these ants because a lot of ants out here produce formic acid and it's not very tasty at all and so you probably find the ants are fairly safe hence them climbing all over it they would be very aware of any predators that they do have and not go and climb right towards it so i don't think these guys are ant feeders at all and so i think the ants are pretty safe just to move around but what a cool little frog this is i'm so excited that it stayed for all of us because i was ho i was thinking it might run away but it seems as though it's going to stay right where it is susan no not a poisonous frog generally if an animal is relying on camouflage it is not poisonous or toxic in any way when animals are toxic they normally have coloration that will basically tell you that they are an animal that doesn't need well that can't be eaten and they have bright colors they don't have the need to camouflage when there's something that can be eaten unfortunately they have to have a really good camouflage in order to hide away from predators and so you can see this guy's got perfect if we actually come up to the top here craig and leave him down on the ground and you look down on the actual little frog you can see there that it looks just like part of the road you wouldn't really have if you were driving along you wouldn't see that at all there's no ways you'd see it if you're driving and so it's just kind of sitting there on the road which is absolutely amazing so now let's leave our little bush frog rain frog i hope that it's going to kind of waddle its way into the bush and away from us I must say it has gotten seriously humid all of a sudden, so Craig and I are both kind of, I think, feeling a little bit hot at this, this stage. I don't know why it's so humid. It's not that kind of warm, but anyway. Right, let's send you back to Brent, who's got a leopard walking towards him. There we go. Tingana is moving right next to us again. He's still mobile south down the boundary. Isn't that awesome? right next to us. I do love spending time with these big cats. Okay, let's stick with him. As I say, he's right on the boundary. If he goes to the right, he's out of our zone, but he might head up the Mulwanini uh, to the left behind the dam wall. Oh, quickly across the tailor. Look at this cool caterpillar that this drongo is caught. It's huge. I wonder if it's from a swallowtail. Oh, that's so cool. That's amazing. Goodness, drongo, that's a really, 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 really massive caterpillar. I don't know how you're going to eat that. We can enjoy watching it, though, banging it on the branch, killing it. I don't think it's a hairy caterpillar, so it won't need to wipe it so much. It's even got a bit of a stick on its head. Oh. Dum, 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 dum. Well done. That was impressive. <laughs> that was so cool. Ah, oh, I wish we could see more caterpillars like that on Bushwalk. Don't you also hope? Well, I hope so. Wish. We also could have been from a green striped hawk moth. We've been seeing a lot of their larvae around at the moment. They're big and green and fat like that. Very cool. Are you chuffed with yourself now? I bet you're full. I think it's still trying to get rid of that piece of grass or whatever stuck on its head. Now, cat brag, I, I don't think a lot of birds are named necessarily for what they eat. A lot of birds are, get their names from their calls. Um, bless you. Look at the sneeze. Is that, that's the call of the Fergus. Um, off it goes. So, no, not necessarily... Um, is he still there? Oh, there he is. Oh, hello, camera. It's that filter again. <laughs> Every now and then... <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of there must be something in the air at the moment that's making everything crazy um, so yeah I'm just trying to think of an animal that's named after what it eats so I suppose an African fish eagle but they don't just eat fish and they typically will eat other birds um, and they scavenge quite a bit too they eat a number of different things we've even seen one eating a terrapin not so long ago so that should be the African fish terrapin carcass eating eagle is what that one should be called. And what else is named? So, bee eater? Yeah, specializing not just bees, but catching wasps and anything that flies, really. It could also be called the dragonfly eater. Again. So, sometimes, yes or no, but uh, most of the time, I mean, a bird's diet is not just restricted to one thing. They eat a variety of different things. And uh, they need to obviously be able to uh, change their diet up slightly. Uh, because, well, what happens if there's no bees around? Then you're going to starve. African hawk moth doesn't just eat hawks. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Peg is just saying the African hawk moth doesn't just eat hawks. Can you imagine moths flying around? <laughs> also, <laughs> I'm choking on my saliva, sorry. For Draw Bird Day, which of course is today, uh, VM said to me that I need to draw a giant drongo catching an elephant so perhaps that's what we'll try and do but before the drive ends today is i'll try and draw a dr giant drongo seeing as though we're looking at one that'd be quite funny um my drawing skills are atrocious so not as bad as james's i think james wins with being the worst drawer in camp he can have that title very cool now it's finished i bet he's full after that that was like the equivalent of eating a big burger in one bite very impressive Wisteria, I love your comment this morning. Thank you. You said you love the way that this bird stands out against the tree. Yes, the beautiful darkness of its black feathers is quite lovely, especially standing out against the bright light. Pity we can't see that red eye too well. well. Very nice, though. We're lucky to see it. Hey, very, very lucky. It's so relaxed. I don't know what's in front of it, if it's... A spider web of sorts that is on that little knob thorn tree. Perhaps we'll have to change our game to birding this morning and watching them feast. Hopefully we can see some more. It seems as though Tingana's up and about. Let's go see what he's doing. Well, he's still moving straight down the boundary. He hasn't turned off yet, but uh, he's walked quite far, quite quickly this morning. So we're actually coming up towards um, the next boundary, which is um, at the bottom of Chitra. So we'll see we'll see what happens now, whether he he turns to the east or he keeps going south. Just a Okay, so we're with them now. So the top of the hill at the end of the road there is sort of the next boundary more or less uh, on the horizon. And he's moving quite steadily. Let's get into the right gear. Maybe first, Celeste. There we go. Let me just roll on behind him. Now, the male leopard who holds the largest territory at the moment, Eugen, is the Anderson male. And so Anderson male, probably followed by Gajima or Hukumuri. Quarantine's also getting quite a big territory at the moment. But I'd say Anderson definitely holds the largest territory at the moment. So here we go, you can see... And you can hear the squirrels shouting at him as he walks. He's not being very stealthy at the moment. The squirrels are very upset. Now I'm hoping he does turn in to the left at some point. see his ears are still flitting about he's definitely still conscious of what's going on around um, I'm hoping he does spot something to stalk on a nice cool morning like this <whistles> yeah a chin spot batters in the distance He must take left at the next road. Now, Tingana is getting on, so he is suffering a little bit. Douglas, um, health issues. Generally being beaten up by other leopards is the biggest health issue that older leopards suffer from. Uh, Tingana got a bit of a hiding from Hukumuri. And... Uh, 
and then also oh, I suppose uh, lack of speed they get obviously a bit slower as they get older let's see is he listening is he listening and he's going to the left that's great news but he is going into uh, some thickets there we'll see what if we can follow him just Dill, you first stand by please can you take over controlling that vessel's old driveway at junction he's now mobile slightly more to the east into Chitwa Okay, so I was just handing over uh, the control of the sighting to my brother, so I don't need to talk on the, the radio. I'm just going to jump around ahead of him. Now, the fact that he's left the road, I'm just trying to find a nice, there we go, a clear spot to get off the road here. And say so it's quite a thick area. You might be heading for this big termite mound here, is what I think. So we're just going to try to get into the spot ahead of the termite mound. Hold on. Oop. Bah. Okay. He might go up to the top of this termite mound. He might just carry on past. Normally, no, he's not He's not being a, a normal leopard today. He's going to carry on past the termite mound. I'm just going to go around it. I can. Um, we're getting quite close to the southern boundary of Chitwa, so I think let's just stick with him for a little bit. We might not get too many more views of him if he crosses the southern boundary. I'm going to get some nice views of him shortly. There he is. It's always wonderful to watch a leopard moving through the grass. See how they sort of melt in and out. Uh, he's looking up in the tree. I also saw him watch looking up the tree. So I decided to have a look, see if there's anything up there, but I can't see anything. He's hoping there was a free meal about. Now, there's definitely signs of a leopard climbing this tree at some point. So maybe you can smell something. So you can actually see what little flakes of the marula bark have come off where another leopard has climbed this tree. So you can see those little patches there. It looks like he's definitely smelt something here. It would be, it'd be quite unusual if he climbed that tree with no meat in it. I think he's just smelling. Um, which could be Hasana here, it could be Kuchava. What's there, big boy? Look at that! I said it's going to be very unusual if he climbs a tree with no meat in it. I wonder what... Look at that. Now, it's very unusual that male leopards climb trees like this with no good reason. And he must be smelling something. There might have been a kill... Might be... Could be a it might have been a kill in this tree. But that's it. Wasn't that beautiful? Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? I said it's very unusual for male leopards to just climb trees. Here we go. Look at him. Coming down again. Very unusual behavior. Monkey's alarm calling, but I don't think they're for him. They could very easily be another leopard. Probably Hasana in the area. There we go. He's mobile again. Heading back towards the boundary. 
I think he must have smelled something. Now, if we have a look at the tree quickly, Vampy, you can see how I knew another leopard had climbed that tree. So now you can see there's more of those marks now that he's come down the tree and gone up the tree. Very interesting. I wonder what he, what, what he was thinking. Okay. Now, out in the African bush, oh, that stick nearly got me. Uh, do you, it's very unusual for animals uh, sort of to get to the, to the age where eyesight starts to fail and all that type of stuff. They will normally die um, from competition with other, other animals far before they get to that eyesight failing stage. That type of stuff only really happens in captivity. In the wild, it's a tough place, and they don't really ever get to that stage. So. Stations, there's also a monkey's alarm calling, sounds like, to the east of the brown ivory tree. Uh, not, not alarming at Tingana. Okay. Where are you going to stick with him? See if he crosses out of the boundary. If if he does, we'll go see what those monkeys are shouting at. In the meantime, let's send you back to Tristan. Well, hopefully you'll find another leopard. Maybe Hosanna is trailing Tingana as he has been over the past few weeks. But what we're looking at here is something that I've never seen before, and neither has Herbie. Neither of us actually know what it is. We think it's an egg casing for maybe a beetle of some sort, but we have no idea exactly what it is. Maybe some of you at home who are very clever souls will be able to help us out. Just remember hashtags for live or YouTube chat, but it's a very intricate little egg case. You can see it's got a beautiful kind of cream coloration with these black markings on either side and then like a little brown spot on the top. So it should be easy enough to kind of find if we can just find egg cases for beetles and those kind of things it's obviously a lot of different types there's actually two here so we've got one over here and then another one over here and it's on a white berry bush that's what this is on so i'm going to try and see if i can find what a white berry bush is a host for in terms of larval animals and, and we'll try and see what it is but very 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 cool to see now the reason we spotted these actually herbie spotted them is because we were looking at my absolute favorite track that we have for hyenas out here so back on this side there's a hyena that walks around this area that is an anomaly to the hyena world and has a very different track than everybody else's and it just goes to show that sometimes you've got to pay quite close attention to what you're looking at and i know a few people that have been caught by this track already so if we get down and we kind of have a look where i've circled you'll find that you've got the toes of this hyena over here they're the four toes with a very signature banana shaped toe but as we come down the back of the pad that comes down like this you'll notice that there is one so that is the one lobe there then there is the second lobe there and then a third lobe that comes around so there we go I'll just highlight them for you so this hyena is completely different to any other hyena of track these are three lobes which hyenas are not supposed to have hyenas are supposed to have two lobes and it's only on one foot funny enough so it's one of the it's it's front it looks like it's front left foot that is um, like this sorry it's back left I don't know I said front left but it's back left foot that has this kind of little sort of three markings like that and it can confuse people quickly because sometimes when we drive and we're looking for tracks a lot of the time what you spot as a track is very seldom actually the toes for me a lot of the time it's this pad part at the back that gives it away and when you see three like this you sometimes get excited and it could be a leopard but it is most definitely a hyena so very very cool to see whether it's a growth on the actual foot or it's just a kind of deformity of the pad i don't know maybe it got injured when it was younger and it's kind of split the pad somehow don't know it doesn't look like a split it just looks like the pad has grown that extra lobe by some miracle now what we also have around us while we're sitting here and we often talk about aging of tracks and this ant is hopefully going to oblige with that is that when we say we age tracks there's a lot of indications that can tell us how fresh a track is and ants are probably one of your biggest helps because ants move around a lot and particularly things like these pugnacious ants that are moving about all over the place you can see them kind of walking all around us on the road and they often 
are around like this, they come onto tracks and they'll basically walk straight across it and they'll disturb particles of soil. So if you look in the middle of this track here, I was watching the ants earlier, that's why I know that this was done by them. You see that there's a particle right there at the end of the grass stem that is sitting on top of the surface of this track. So what happened was an ant came over the top. And you can actually see the path that the ant took there. It came along and there you go. See how they come over the top of the ridges? And it came over the ridge like this and this little particle dropped from this ridge down and sat on top of it so we know then that a daylight animal has caused a disturbance on the top of the track and therefore must have been early hours of this morning or last night if it was fresher than that and i'm just going to put my finger on top of this little stone look at that you see how it gets pushed down into the sand and disappears there's no longer that sort of particle on top so that is how you're able to age tracks and look at them and see where they're going pretty cool to see now talking about tracks we were following the tracks of that male line, but they are heading straight to where the Inkahumas went, and we have a situation where there's audio apparently from the, the guys that are on Bifflesook for a male that sounds like pretty close to where the kill site was, where the torchwoods were feeding, and so I don't think she's going, all well, that male is still on our side, so we've just kind of given that up, and now we're just looking at all kinds of interesting things that we can find. Good, let's send you back across to Taylor. Oh, hang on a second, sorry, just two seconds. There's something here that I've seen that's feeding on a bit of fresh scrub hair dung. Come on, turn over for me, Beetle. Is it alive even? There we go, look at that. So it's a dung beetle, but one of the most colorful dung beetles that we get out of here. Look at the amazing coloration. It's almost got this bronze with these bright green little legs. Now it's trying to roll a ball. I actually thought it was a piece of scrub hair dung, but it's not. It looks like maybe a pellet from a impala or something like that that's been modified and rolled by this dung beetle. But how beautiful is that little beetle? Look at the colors on it. Very, very, very cool. I haven't seen one of these in ages. I actually even forgetting the name of the spe specific dung beetle. We get them here every now and then. They're small. They never get very big. And you don't see them that often. I, like I say, I haven't seen one in a very long time. But you see how it protects itself. When it gets kind of afraid, it's tucking its head. See, it tucks its head and its legs. If I put the grass stalk there, you see how its head tucks down and the legs in underneath it. So it's using that hard exoskeleton to protect the soft leg areas. Absolutely amazing. Sorry, little dung beetle. I didn't mean to disturb you. I thought you might have been dead because you're on your back. And there you go. You see, it can also fly. How cool is that? Very, very cool. Sorry, Taylor, I know you were doing a spot of birding, but that was very, very, very cool. And a lot of you are saying that this is the most beautiful dung beetle that you've seen. Right. Now, I am going to send you across to Taylor. Hopefully, she still has the birds that she was looking at. I feel bad because birds fly away, but let's go and have a look. suppose you have to see birds to be birding. They've been avoiding us for the moment, so we're just going on a little bit of a bumble, just enjoying the nice, cool morning. It's obviously the... The clouds are quite thick, this haze, fog mist, whatever it may be, is still lingering around. It feels like it should be raining, but it isn't. At least the humidity has dropped slightly, which is quite nice. You know what we'll do is let's just jump up ahead. I can see the brown ivory tree, and we know that it's got fruit on it at the moment, so we'll probably be able to find some African green pigeons. Well, I'm hoping if they haven't gobbled up all the fruit, although I ate quite a bit of it the other day, so... I'm competing with the birds now. Oh, and there's also a jacket plum here. I don't think that jacket plum had fruit on, but it was where we had some really nice um, African green pigeon sightings too. Okay, let's check this tree. I can't even see anyone bouncing around in it just yet. I'm sure there will be a couple. Let me just get it, find a little gap that we can look inside the tree because it's got quite a thick layer of leaves. Oh. oh, so this is the brown ivory tree, yeah. Now we look up. Where are you, birdies? I actually don't see anything. No leaves moving at all. That's unusual. Especially for a tree that's bearing fruit at the moment. Perhaps it was short-lived. Oh, I can see a squirrel, though. Um, how do I point this out? Can you see it, Ferg? On the trunk of the tree, 
Uh, yeah, if you go quite high up. Okay. Oh, there's one. Another one. That's fine. We can look at that one. It's hiding now. You can just see its tail moving around. Lots of squirrels that will be living in here. And then if you go up a little, if you follow, if you keep going, there's going to be a trunk that splits off a little bit to the right from the one on the left. Uh, not that one, the middle one. Yeah, I keep going. You're almost on. There we go. There's a squirrel there. If you zoom center frame, just in the shadows. And then now it's the top right. There we go. There's another squirrel. Also just hiding behind some leaves. But sitting there very still. Probably thinks that we can't see it. We can see you, squirrel. We know you're there. They'll also be enjoying the fruit of the brown ivory. It's delicious. It's yellow. Well, it goes yellow when it's ripe. It's green when it's not ripe. It's quite pulpy. But there is a big seed in the middle, but it's so tasty. It's like an apricot cotton something else. And very sweet. Very nice. You're just sitting very still, aren't you, squirrel? I can't believe there's no birds in here. Oh, that's such a pity. Anyways, do you know what I did do for you? I said I was going to try and draw a bird, so I have. You can hear the birds. And I said that I was going to try and draw a giant drongo eating an elephant. So that is what I've done for you this morning. There we go. So we would love to see yours as well. That is mine. Very nice. I can't draw a whole bird though. It doesn't really look like a drongo either. You just have to pretend that it is a drongo. And it's gobbling up an elephant. Yum. I don't even know if we're still live anymore. All right, let's carry on. Look at this tree. I can't believe there's no birds here. Like, I'm really shocked. There's full of, well, this one, Gwari, is full of fruit. Those are delicious to eat as well. You just don't want to eat too many of them as uh, well. You're going to stay in your teeth, and you're going to have a very purple tongue. You don't have to eat too many of them. And what they would normally use that for, and back in the Eastern Cape where there were cave sort of painting, rock art sort of been done, they would mix the fruit of the guari berry and some animal fats and different types of soils, and they'd mix them all together, and that's actually one of those things that they would use. And we also used to use that to dye clothes. They would try and press out all the juice. It's just quite cool, and it's delicious. So nice. It's like one of my favorite fruits to eat, except that Pip is so big. Anyways, right, off you go to uh, Brentu is well, acting like a bloodhound today, and he's following Tingana. Oh, he nearly gave us a slip through some thickets, but he has come back uh, and changed direction completely. He's heading sort of northeast now, which is good for us. He's heading back towards the dam. I'm in a small open area quite close by and he might go for another drink so let's get into position to see if he goes for another drink try to get around in front of him it doesn't look like he's going to stop for a drink um, he's definitely on the hunt and uh, oh, leadwoods everywhere. Let's try to get around. Now, the reason I'm hesitant to drive over and through leadwoods is I don't feel like changing tires today. And there's quite a lot of little leadwoods here. Looks like he was heading down this path, wasn't it, Jim? Here he comes. So we managed to stick with him through the thickets. He might head down uh, towards the Mulwanini to directly behind the, the dam wall. He seems to like that area. He's covered a fair bit of distance since we've been with him. And who knows how far he walked 
uh, before we found him. That old man. Uh, he could definitely do with the meal. I think he's finished all the baby water back around Chitwa Dam. Uh, oops, sorry, my head, Vim. Now you see he's going to be, he's right next to us now again. No more than about a meter and a half. Completely non plussed with the vehicles. So he's heading back towards the damn wall. Just going to get, let other people take a chance to get in front and I'm going to loop ahead of him again. Uh, if he keeps walking down that road and uh, we'll wait for him there. Now one of the other reasons I, I really like looping ahead of leopards and lions in particular is it gives me a chance to see what's up ahead. So if there's a nyala or water buck or impala so we can put ourselves in a position uh, to see if how he's got how he's gonna hunt and um, and make sure we're in a good position to see what's happening without interfering in the hunt. Okay. So we'll see which junction he takes here. Oh my brother is calling me, sorry one second. Go ahead Dom. Uh, just stand by, I'm live, I'll touch you in five. Okay. It looks like he's going into this difficult area again, behind the damn wall. So if he drops down, we're going to have to shoot around quite far. Now, leopard scent marking, Douglas, it, it depends on a lot of different things. Um, Tingana at the moment, or most male leopards after rain, will scent mark quite profusely to re-scent their areas. We've seen Okamuri doing it now, Tingana, except Tingana's territory has shrunk with uh, the moving of Okamuri and, and quarantines even started moving into traditional Tingana territory. I think we're going to lose him shortly. Hopefully we'll be able to find him again on the other side. But we're not going to be able to even you know, even dream of getting a car through these Tumberti thickets. Let's just have a look at him disappearing down. So the, the little ponds where the baby crocodiles are are just in here, but he's slightly to the southeast of it. And you'll see why I say it's near impossible to follow. You can see it's a, a wall of green in there. So I think we're going to shoot round um, down into the little riverbed to catch up with him. While we do that, let's go across to Tristan, who's obviously getting hungry because he started eating grass. Well, no, no, not really, Brenty. I'm walking up. We are coming out of the Mulawati at the moment, and I just found some... Well, basically a strip of bark, and so it's quite an interesting kind of thing. This is obviously something that's been taken by Ellie's, so they would have chewed on it. And what they've done is they've stripped it out to try and get this red that you see on here. So that red substance is known as cambium, and that's actually what the Ellie's are after. So a lot of the time we see elephants stripping bark, and we think they're after that woody outer layer. No, they're after this instead, and they strip it off in these long strips, and then they chew it, and they get the nutrients out of it. Now, this was just a piece that kind of came off, probably a much bigger batch that they had, and I'm looking forward to seeing fresher signs of this. Unfortunately, this is an old piece that was just on the ground as we were walking up, but I'm looking forward to hopefully having some Ellie's back in the area. It's been very quiet on the elephant front, but I heard yesterday when we were with Shadulu that there was a massive herd that was seen at Sydney's Dam, which I think, maybe, just maybe, might have been Fang's herd, because that's the only really big, big, big herd that we have, and the way the guys were talking, you would swear 
that there was an elephant migration that had taken place and every single elephant in the world was here. <laughs> I, was, I was giggling, actually, because the guys were being very dramatic about the number of elephants that were at Sydney's Dam. Maybe they were right. Maybe there were hundreds of them, but I doubt that it was that many. You'd probably find it was a good sort of 40 of them that were together. And that's, like I say, Fang's herd is about that size. The only one that I know of in this area that we see regularly that's about that size. Anyway, we're still just meandering about looking for little things we've been having some laughs with Herbie. We were reminiscing about a time when a certain camera operator came here for an interview and couldn't finish the bushwalk. He said he was too tired and then Jamie, who as we know is not the biggest of our presenters in this area, so Herbie's actually giggling in front of me, but you see there he's laughing. So <laughs> we know that Jamie is not the biggest when it comes to presenters out here and she um, had to take it upon herself to offer this poor gentleman a helping hand to carry the bushwalk pack so that he could complete the walk back to home. I think eventually did he, I think he got fetched by a vehicle eventually because he couldn't do it, which is a bit ridiculous when you think about it because it's not like we run around, we amble about. Now, there's a Franklin that's on top of a tree that's just flown away. Why would there be a Franklin there? It's interesting. Franklins very seldom go up trees like that unless they may be either been disturbed by a predator or and then it's a territorial vocalizing to try and tell other males that they are the dominant individual. So pretty interesting that it was up there. We'll just check around here in case there's maybe some sign for a leopard. While we do that, let's head back to Taylor who's got something else in a tree. Well, we've got yellow-billed hornbills. They're supposed to be in the trees, but they're playing hide-and-seek with us this morning. <laughs> they keep hiding behind all the branches. I think they're looking for caterpillars that could be sort of moving around. You see that? See how you can't, we can't see too well, but you can just see that head is moving and then hopping to the next branch, searching, searching. So they must be checking on the undersides of the leaves, perhaps because it is a bit of a cooler day. They're not active and they're still just hiding away. And bush willows are good ones to check. So now what they don't do, uh, unlike, say, the parrots and the southern black tits and also the white-crested helmet shrikes, is that often they'll go through all of the bush willow trees and check those seed pods that you can see. Uh, but the hornbills don't do that. They don't sort of check each pod to find the, the little, I think it's a grey moth that parasitizes the inside of those seeds. And um, those three birds that I mentioned before are able to detect when they're inside them. And then they crush them open and, and eat the little larvae. I don't think the hornbills do that. I've never seen them do that. So I think they were genuinely checking on the underside. What are you doing? What did you just regurgitate? A little seed or something? And off it goes. Oh, okay. Well, that, that was our hornbill sighting. Let's see who else we can find. Short and sweet. Maybe we'll get some eating termites. I'm pretty sure if we can just find an active termite mound, we should be able to see some little birdies. But otherwise it has been quiet. And I do, Tristan, I'm a bit sad that we haven't got any elephants at the moment. Oh, no, too late. It was a turtle dove, but it didn't break quick enough. Um, it would be nice to have the elephants back. They are such a, a saving grace on quiet days because you can sit with them for ages and ages. But I'm sure they will be back at some point. They just needed a little holiday away from us, didn't they? I had a little scratch around Treehouse Dam too to see if I could find that male lion, but um, I couldn't. I could see where all their tracks were on, from the southern road of Treehouse Dam. And then they obviously just cut right through the block. Oh. And, well, we don't have much going on here, so we'll keep looking for more birds. But Tristan is doing a bit of investigating. I wonder if he's worked out what chased that Franklin in a tree. We are, Taylor. We are looking at a unfortunate crime scene of a tortoise that has been snacked, unfortunately. You can see a bit of its leg there on top of the piece of shell. And given that you can still see a bit of the leg, you would have a situation where this is probably fairly fresh. I would say yesterday, maybe yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning, and then through the course of the day, it kind of just got scattered about. But this would have been done by hyenas, this poor leopard tortoise was taken by hyenas and the reason why we know it's a leopard tortoise is because if we look at the scoot over here 
There you go. You can see the cream coloration with the black spots, which is indicative of a leopard tortoise. If it was a speaks hingeback tortoise, you wouldn't get these black spots on the scutes itself. And you can see that this has basically been picked clean. There's a little bit of moisture underneath there. So hyena has really gone to town and completely crunched this poor tortoise up. And it's amazing the thickness of the bone that they can go through, if you or shell, if they if you want to call it that. Look at how thick that is. And they've just crunched straight through it and been able to then get the meat inside and eat this tortoise and kind of finish it up and we know that some of our leopards do this but this amount of damage is indicative of more hyenas than anything else so poor tortoise met a horrible end in fact what i've picked up here would have been where the head was you see that the the shell kind of bends in and curves in like that so this is where the head would have come out and the, the reason it has this little section is so when it's feeding the head can go up and kind of then still have range of movement if the shell extended past the head wouldn't be able to lift and they'd kind of just hit their head on their own shell which is pretty crazy because if you turn it upside down you can actually see where the shell joins to the animal is quite recessed so this is all protection when the head comes in but it still needs to be able to have range of motion to be able to feed and that V is where the head would have come out unfortunately never very nice at all when you see these kind of things but is nature and you have a situation where other animals need to eat and so things like hyenas will have to sometimes unfortunately chomp down on a tortoise good now let's carry on it seems as though Brent has found a way through the thickets and is still with Tinkana He's on the other side of some very marshy, muddy areas that I'm not even going to attempt, but you can just see him through the Tumberti thicket there. He's heading we're directly below the dam at the moment, and uh, I just had a look at all the tracks down there. There are so many tracks that he's been spending a lot of time here. going now. I wonder if he's going to try catch a baby crocodile. Let's just try and move above him there, Liam. Now, even though some of these areas look not bad, if you try to drive through there, woo, you might get very stuck. So we shall go around that area. Now, there's, there he is. Now, there's a lot of baby crocs here, and uh, leopards will, as I say, are opportunists, and especially a hungry leopard like him. Um, he might be looking not only for baby crocodiles in, the, in this little swampy patch here, but also for monitor lizards, um, anything he can find, really. He's moved right to the edge of one of these little marshes. He's sitting and listening and watching at the moment. Incredible the patience that leopards have. You can see he's just listening. He's he's still looking reasonably alert. Ah, and he's going to have a snooze. And he's decided he's walked long and far enough today. Time for a rest, unless something happens to wander towards him. I don't think we're going to get a better view, unfortunately, without getting very stuck. <laughs> a little clean after his busy morning and humidity Tristan was talking about has definitely set in so as the mist cleared we thought the Sun would just burst out but there seems to be a, a front of clouds that have moved in and you can see how incredible the 
camouflages. <laughs> and I said Tangana might be hunting for those baby crocs that live around here. But Douglas is wondering, has a crocodile ever eaten a leopard? I'm sure they have. I have never seen it. it it's one of those very rare things. But I'm certain somewhere in Africa, a crocodile has most certainly eaten a leopard. Probably in places like the Okavango, South Luangwa, where, or even Lower Zambezi, or Kagera, or Queen Elizabeth, where quite a few of the, the animals actually, or the lions, the leopards, hyenas, and even the wild dogs have to cross uh, deep bodies of water quite regularly. His ears are still going. I'm trying to see. I don't see anything. Ah, there's a black crack. Well spotted, Vim. Beautiful little secretive bird that hangs about in the marshes. And normally they are hidden in the long grass. And there's a nice view of one out in the open. Doesn't know we're watching it. You can see they're not made for um, sitting on branches so much. They've got big wide feet for walking on marshy areas. So they can be a bit cumbersome when they're not in the marsh, you can see how long their toes are. Oh, not not very elegant at all uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to balancing and on on branches. Far more at home on the ground and in the grass. You can see he's still alert and sitting there, so definitely not bored. Banana, I'd say yes, certain animals get bored, particularly young animals and particularly predator cubs. So hyenas, lions, leopards, wild dogs, uh, their, their cubs and pups definitely do get bored. I almost would say Hosanna still gets bored. And he does silly things to entertain himself. Oh, the crake is back in the tree. That's a bit of a better branch for it to walk down. It's a bit bigger. And it's gone behind the branch. Very pleasant down in the little river systems. I will be drawing my bird for Draw Bird Day on the Sunset Safari, not on the Sunrise Safari. I'm far more focused on leopards right now, not drawing birds. It almost seems like he's listening to something in the grass. Not too intently, though. But I know Taylor's already drawn her bird. And uh, it was a little bit far-fetched. Uh, let's see what she's up to for the last couple of minutes of drive. Looking for birds, we saw a little robin of sorts singing a beautiful tune. And then it bounced and flew away, so I couldn't see it properly. And now I've been trying to open up my bird app on my phone, but for some bizarre reason it's saying loading. I don't know what it is loading, what update it is miraculously done on its own. So I can't even have a look and show you properly because I wanted to identify it by its call. It was definitely one of the little robins. Um, but just one a call that I hadn't heard for a while. So sadly I'm not going to be able to even play any, any of them for you now. So we're still trying to do birding, still looking for anything bouncing from branch to branch. But it's quite a cool morning and... Nobody seems to really be awake, not even the insects. I think that caterpillar that that drongo ate earlier was fast asleep and didn't even know what got it. A nice meal for that drongo though. I don't think it's going to have to go search for uh, another meal straight away. I reckon it will probably be okay for a little while. Have a little half-time snack at 11 o'clock maybe. But otherwise... Very quiet. Oh, you know what we did see earlier, jumped out on the road, was while we were trying to follow the lions. I, I suspect the lions may have flushed it out, was a bronze wing courser. 
which is quite cool to see because I hadn't seen one for a little while. So that was really nice. And then also, you don't normally see them out during the day. They tucked away like the night jars and will spend their time out at night. But on a day like today, I suppose you could see something, yeah. It would be quite cool. Right, I'm still looking for things on the leaves though. There's a little bird, but you're not going to sit still. I know you're not. It's hard to get these little LBJs that bounce around. Well, no one is willing to play ball today. Oh, Tristan and the bush, well, Tristan and the bush rotting, and Craig and Herbie actually walked down this road, walked down Zoe's, and then I think they went along Rebecca's because I saw all their tracks marching. Just as fast as the Nguma lions were walking, so were Tristan. Ah, now I didn't hear what Tristan actually has, but it's something which is more than what we've got. We have, well, don't blink because you'll miss it, moving across the frame. It is, well, very, very slimy and not everybody's favorite animal. But what we have is a slug. So we've got a big slug that is coming across the road. They often come out after a bit of rain. And so this guy is just slowly creeping along past us and along the road. Now, it needs to be quite careful because otherwise it's going to get squashed by a car particularly if it sits in the middle of the road like this. They're quite difficult to see, these guys. But you can see the eyes on the front, kind of looking at Craig. It's coming towards Craig. Craig, be careful. You might get attacked by a slug. You don't want to be attacked by a slug. They have a nice mucus layer on the underside, which is not everyone's favorite thing. I think many people actually kind of shiver at the word slug. I don't know why. I, I don't actually mind them too much. I think they're quite funny things. And this particular one is a rather large slug. It's a kind of big individual. You can see if I put my hand next to it, that's not exactly that small. It's kind of the size of my pinky finger. And you can see actually how it kind of contracts itself now. Look, you see it's protecting itself. So it's contracting in. Look, 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 look. How cool is that? That's very, very cool. So it gets into a kind of contract and then pulls its skin nice together in order to try and kind of protect itself. And the eyes have gone in underneath and it is now in protection phase. What you can also see is at the back here, you will see that there is a sort of slime layer. Look, you see that? There's the slime. I'm going to try and sort of lift it for you. I oh, know it's breaking under the weight of the stones, but you can see if I move it around. There we go. So there is the slime layer that it ex excretes to be able to move and to get not to well, to reduce the amount of friction from the sand so it's able to walk along so you often find these slime layers and then you know that a slug has been there and it, it basically sticks to all the sand itself but it creates a nice smooth surface for the slug's body to be able to move over much like the giant land snails similar kind of thing but very cool to see not often that we get to see these guys out and about so it's probably going to stay all hidden like that until we move off so we'll Ah, very clever, Rebecca. I see you are on top of your game today. So Rebecca is saying it's very similar to maybe something like a sea slug. And that dive live is starting to happen in the next... F well, it has started already. It's kicked off. It's And talking about kicking and, and kicking off, remember that you can be a part of all of it. And you can go on to divelive.wildearth.kickstarter to go and check out how to be involved and how to become a part of the Dive Live family and in enjoy some interesting things that are going to be taking place over the next little bit and it's going to be amazing to see some of the stuff that the guys are going to find under the sort of surface of the water it's a unexplored world for us really and we don't know much about it so it's going to be amazing to kind of see what the guys find and what we can learn about the underwater world i think it's going to be very cool now we are slowly moving our way home we've kind of done a big loop and we're back onto twin dams road and kind of going northwards poor craig was very very lost and so herbie was explaining to him exactly where we were and tied himself to craig so that craig wouldn't get lost and that's how they were going to walk home anyway we're going to carry on while we do that let's send you back across to brent to finish things up for the morning Well, Tingana just went poof, absolutely flat and uh, we couldn't really see him behind the grass. So we decided to take a little bumble on our way home. And who knows, maybe Hosanna will make an appearance somewhere in this area, as he likes to do so often. But uh, what a lovely morning. I mean, such drama with the lions, but it was still nice to catch up with Tingana. From the last update I heard, it sounds like 
the, Inca, the Torchwoods ran away from the Inkoomas. The Inkoomas are lying down where the Torchwoods had the Warthog kill. And the Torchwoods are lying not too far away. So I'll try to get some more details after drive on how brutal or bloody or not brutal or bloody it was. And it's, it's always very fascinating when you get two prides that you know were, were one pride or related uh, interacting after an extended period of not seeing each other. Fascinating stuff, I tell you. Okay, now, uh, gremlins like to live in this dip, so I'm just going to shoot through it very quickly. Okay, we should be gremlin free from now. So let's have a quick look to see if our little chief has arrived around here. Doesn't look like it. Uh, so we're going to keep heading towards home. Okay, let's go see some wildly beasts on quarantine. We've got the only one in the northern Sabi sand this morning. It's the one that, uh, well, frequents the open areas behind camp, but he's not in an open area. He's standing up on a termite mound, and I don't blame him because this particular spot that he is at is filled with thatching grass, and we know how tall the thatching grass can actually get. And if I were a wildebeest, I don't think I'd want to be walking through it. It would be taller than the top of his head. So... I think standing up on the termite mound will do him the world of good, being able to spot anything that's moved through here. Probably a bit on edge with those lions that were quite vocal this morning. And wildebeest do get a bit jumpy. He's been listening to the birds, as well. there's a bit of chatter behind him, and he's not paying much attention to us. He's listening to the sounds of the bush, listening to the whispers in the wind, which is a bit of a breeze starting to sort of... Blow around at the moment. Hello, boy. Perhaps he's going to have a little nap up there, too. That head seems to be getting heavier and heavier. Maybe he's been up all night worried. And when you are a wildebeest who waits around for the girls to come to him, depending on how good your territory is, I think he's got a fairly good spot. But I feel like he's taking on a bit more than he can chew because he is often on quarantine, the open plains behind camp, and he's sort of sort of move slightly more northwest and I think that's too big you don't want to have too big of a territory and he's lucky he's got Voyatella Dam he's got lovely grazing nice spots nice shelter I think he could just relax a little bit don't you, you can hear the arrow mark babblers as well they're all shouting about in the back that's what he's listening to at the moment Joy, if you look very carefully on a wildebeest, and this is the blue wildebeest, or the brindled gnu, as they're also called, that's really just hair, um, sort of growing against the grain, if you will. It's amazing how it, it sort of changes color. Um, but I reckon if you had to brush that flat, um, it would be it would be normal again. Really nice, though. And that's how you can see where they get their color. Some wildebeest show a little bit more than others, and this fella um, are probably coming into breeding season now as well, looking fit and looking lovely, don't you think? All muscled up, all fat from on the nice green grass. But a cool morning, though. Nice to have a quick glimpse of uh, the lions on the move, listening to them. Always good to hear lions roar. And I really was shocked by the youngest in Kahuma's roar, because she sounded like a male at one point. But how cool was that? Anyways, I I trust that you all in, uh, enjoyed the safari. It was really quite wonderful. And um, I'm hoping that those Nkuhumas come back. Or maybe we can get a glimpse of the Torchwood Pride as they try to escape them. But they're on Bufflesock at the moment, so we can only try and check a little bit later. Anyways, we'll see you again this afternoon for the Sunset Safari. Who knows? Maybe Tingana will make an appearance again. Otherwise, we'll leave it up to the animals.